That's my cue. <laughs> well, good evening uh, and welcome everyone. Jalasi, bienvenue tout le monde, Falche. My name is Richard Eisner. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies here at St. of X and Acting Director of the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. I'd like to extend a welcome to all our guests joining us this evening online for the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government Distinguished Speaking Spe Series. I would like to begin this evening's program with a territorial land acknowledgement. St. Francis Xavier University stands on the lands of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded home of the Mi'kmaq. We express our deep gratitude and appreciation to the generations of Mi'kmaq who since time immemorial have loved and stewarded these lands and the beings who call them home. Colonization is not just history, it exists in the present tense. While we strive to decolonize ourselves and our university, we know there is still much for us to learn. We are committed to doing the hard work of self-reflection and to repairing relationships with the Mi'kmaq on whose lands we reside, including embracing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and embodying their spirit in our day-to-day -day lives. We are all treaty people. Tomorrow evening, we're looking forward to welcoming Elder Albert Marshall back to St. of X and to Mulrooney Hall for a special lecture, engaging in etu optimunk, two-eyed seeing to address climate change. Elder Marshall's lecture will be held in Mulrooney Hall 4032 upstairs tomorrow evening, starting at 7.30. PM, and I would invite everyone to join us for that special lecture. And a reminder that we're holding Student Research Day also in Mulrooney Hall tomorrow, beginning at 6 PM. So hope everyone can come to that as well. This evening, the Brian Mulrooney Institute of Government is honored to welcome Mary Preville as part of its Distinguished Speakers Series. Before I introduce Mary, I'd just like to extend thanks on behalf of the Mulrooney Institute to Dr. Anna Jusleg, Program and Research Manager for organizing Mary's visit and this evening's lecture. Mary uh, Preville is the Vice President of the Space po Program Policy at the Canadian Space Agency, an agency of the Government of Canada, which was actually created by the Mulroney government in 1990, spun out of the National Research Council. Mary joined the Canadian Space Agency in 2016 in her role as Vice President Space Program Policy Mary is responsible for policy planning, international and business relations, and communications and public affairs. Previously, Ms. Preville was Director General Policy in the Earth Sciences Sector at Natural Resources Canada. In this capacity, she was responsible for Arctic logistics in support of scientific advancement, the Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Program, and a number of international and policy issues. For many years, Ms. Preville was the lead executive responsible for energy research and development programs at Natural Resources Canada. She was also a senior advisor with the International Energy Agency in Paris from 1996 to 1998, which must have been a fantastic experience. We'd like to hear more about that too. <laughs> Ms. Preville holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from McGill University and an MBA in Business Administration from the University of Ottawa. Her lecture tonight is entitled, Space, Where To Next? Canada has a long history in space, from being the third country in the world to launch a satellite into space in 1962, to its expertise in building and operating space systems and to its astronaut corps. Tonight, Mary will be discussing the state of Canada's position in the space economy. The space economy is growing exponentially. The world relies on services from space every day, such as banking, weather forecasting, communication, con connectivity, and high-speed internet. In addition, humanity is now exploring further into deep space, increasing our understanding of the universe. The commercial sector, including in Canada, is increasingly getting involved, but governments still have a large role to play. What does all this mean and how does Canada fit into it? Mary's gonna tell us about that tonight. Following uh, Mary's lecture, a Q&A session will be moderated by Dr. Peter Kickert, uh, Irving Shipbuilding Chair in Canadian Arctic Policy with the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. Please join me in welcoming Mary Preville. Thank you very much. 
Dr. Eisner, and um, thank you so much for inviting me, Anna, for helping to arrange this uh, this talk for me in the the next couple of days here on campus. Um, it is really an honor. Uh, it's not often that I get out of Ottawa to actually speak in public uh, across the country, so it uh, it's really uh, it really fun for me. Um, I would have said the CSA, Canadian Space Agency, was created in 1989, but you may be correct in 1990, maybe before it was actually uh, uh, actually established. We can debate that point. Um, so I am uh, have a maybe a funny title for those of you who aren't uh, you know work in the government world space program policy. Um, it pretty much means. I do everything that's not the technical stuff. I don't do the science and technology. I do what is often uh, before we get funding to do uh, missions and programs, um, international relations, economic study. Um, I work a lot liaising with the minister's office, supporting the minister. And as a result, um, my office is in Ottawa. Uh, we have about uh, 30, 40 staff there, that's it. The uh, CSA headquarters is located in Montreal, approximately 70, uh, 700 uh, staff total. We also have uh, one staff in Washington to be close to NASA. And we have uh, a person in Paris who, uh, because the European Space Agency is located in Paris. And we have uh, personnel in Houston at Johnson Space Center, including, including our astronauts. So I mention those because hopefully, even though I don't say explicitly, um, international relations are a really big thing, but in the space uh, world, they are a really, really big thing, especially for a space agency like ours, um, because we are, we are small. Many people um, will often say to me, oh, I didn't know we even had a space agency in Canada. It's like, oh, are you the poor cousin to NASA? And, and you know, NASA is very well known, the largest uh, space agency, of course, in the world. Um, but uh, our mandate at the space agency is to uh, um, grow the space uh, industry in Canada. We do not physically build uh, anything. We push everything out to industry, Canadian industry. Um, and we promote the science enabled by, um, by space. We also have programs for youth from junior kindergarten to grade 12 and as well for university students. So again, we're very much a research and development uh, organization with some operations as well. So I'll try and give you a little bit of our history quickly and then talk about where we're going, where we're going in the, in the future. All right, so um, you might know if you're a history buff, let's see. Jim? <laughs> Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Okay, so Canada was actually the third country in space after uh, Russia and uh, the US. In 1962, we launched our own satellite. Um, it it um, was called uh, um, the words escaping me now. Alouette One, thank you. Alouette One. So NASA issued a an invitation to wanted to diversify, not just be uh, U.S. and Russia in space. Canada took up the call, and so we developed a satellite. It was a scientific satellite that measured from very high up, a thousand kilometers up, this the um, uh, atmosphere, and NASA launched it for us. And we shared the data 
And that started a partnership and a, a, a model that uh, really much exists today is the sharing of data. In 1972, you may know, uh, we actually were the first country to uh, have our own domestic communication satellite. So that was the first time that we were able to link the Canadian North uh, from a communication perspective. Uh, that was called ANIC-1. ANIC means little brother in Inuktitut. You may know of Canada's space robotics. You should because it's on the back of your $5 bill. I know many of you don't use like this kind of money anymore, um, but it is a pride and joy. We are the world leaders in uh, space robotics. Um, the first Canada arm, the robotics was uh, part of the Sp space shuttle program, 1981. In 2001, uh, we sent up Canada arm two, um, we also in 2008 uh, sent up Dexter, which a friend of mine, Dex, whoopsie, sorry. Sorry, Dexter. Oh, here's the pointer, Dexter. That is Canada's handyman robot. So um, a friend of mine called it and an engineer, he called it a uh, robot only an engineer could love. Um, you may recognize some of uh, Canada's astronauts. These are the retired astronauts. There's some faces there you uh, might indeed recognize. You may or may not recognize Canada's core of active astronauts. Uh, sorry, having a hard time with the pointer here. Uh, pointer. Jeremy Hansen, Jenny Seide Gibbons, Josh Kutrick, David St. Jacques. They live and train in Houston. They are embedded with the NASA astronauts. Um, you may know our astronauts are really a source of pride and awe-inspiring for uh, Canada's youth. They are also awe-inspiring for more teenage uh, age kids. So what you may not know is what I'm trying to portray is where this, how big the space sector is getting. So the global space economy is projected to triple by 2040. That's not that long ago uh, from now the 1.1 trillion US dollars. Um, it's mainly due to the lowering of the cost of launch. Um, there's now reusable rocket parts, reusable first stage, um, lower manufacturing costs. Um, some parts are now 3D printed. There's a bit of mass production in some areas. It's also a bit the technological advancements, miniaturization, uh, increasing applications, um, and the governments are pushing uh, further and further into space. And so companies are really taking over where uh, gov once was only government domain. Canada does have end-to-end -end capabilities across the country, both from a technological perspective and a scientific perspective. Um, the only thing Canada does not have right now is domestic launch. You may be aware you're from this region that there is a, a company called Maritime Launch Services that is building Canada's first spaceport in Canso called a spaceport Nova Scotia. Um, in 2022, 2022 broke the record for how many space launches there were based on 2021 and 2020. So in 2022, there was actually 186 launch attempts across the world. There were also seven failures. It does, it does happen. It's projected by 2030 that there will be 24 and a half thousand satellites deployed. 
So it's huge. Now, 64% of that 24 and a half thousand has to do with what is known of now mega constellations, which are uh, uh, satellite communication constellations. Um, you may be familiar with Starlink, uh, which is a SpaceX company, has about um, 3,500 satellites. Now their projection is to about 12,000, maybe going to 42,000. They're a bit reusable though, and they do create some issues that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. But anyways, the important thing is that commercial payloads or launches now outnumber civil uh, space launches missions. So in Canada, um, yearly, because we track this, we survey the space, uh, the space sector every year, $4.9 billion in revenue generated from the space, uh, space sector in 2021. About half of those are exports of Canadian technologies, mostly to the US, but not exclusively. Um, GDP is increasing, $2.8 billion uh, from the space sector contributes to GDP, workforce is increasing. And um, the space sector is really R&D intensive. In fact, it's 18 times more intensive than the average manufacturing sector in Canada. So for those of you that monitor BIRD and business expenditure on R&D, and this, I'll say, it's really low in Canada, in the space sector is actually very high. We also have 40 universities active in some kind of space science across the country, again, from coast to coast. To coast. So that's a little bit where we are, where we've been, where we are now, but where are we going? And I'll talk first a little bit about space exploration, then I'll talk about Earth observation, um, so really, humanity has set its sights on Mars it's, um, with a stepping stone to the moon, from the moon, sorry. With uh, robotic exploration of Mars, of the moon, now there's a push to have human exploration. Um, we like to say Canada has been to the moon, Canadian technology has. This is a this is a photo of really a artist rendition of the Phoenix Mars landers, a NASA mission. It landed in 2008, and it was a mission to. And I everything's a mission in space. So I say mission. That's because that's what everything is called. Um, really study the history of the water cycle on Mars. Um, Canada supplied the meteorological station that went on this, uh, this instrument. And in fact, it's very fitting, and we like to sort of brag that uh, that meteorological station uh, was the one to first confirm snow on Mars. So there was snow detected four kilometers from the surface from Canadian, uh, Canadian instruments. That model is used a lot in the Canadian context where we put a scientific instrument on a uh, um, larger spacecraft. When uh, we necessarily don't, maybe we don't interested in a mission, but we don't have the maybe technological or commercial capacity, but we have scientific expertise, we will make arrangements so that Canadian scientists can participate in these missions. And this is an example of that. Um, which is the InSight uh, uh, mission, again, a NASA mission, um, and um, it was to study geology of uh, Mars. And there, so we say, we like to say there is a Canadian flag on Mars right now. Much more recently, um, some of you may have seen uh, been interested by the James Webb Space Telescope. Some of you may know the Hubble Telescope, uh, December 25th, 2021. Uh, the world's largest space telescope was launched. Again, a NASA mission with the European Space Agency and 
we are actually very, very proud that we had the Canadian Space Agency logo on there um, because again, we supplied some instruments, two instruments, in fact, two of the five. So this, um, this is you. This is the size of about a tennis court. So it, it had to fit on the top of that rocket. It was so huge, it had to be all unfolded after it was, it was uh, released. Um, but it's really redefining what we know about the universe. Um, the two instruments that we supplied on there, one was a critical instrument called the fine guidance sensor. So that, what that does is it identifies where this telescope is in space. So it's great if you point the telescope at somewhere in the universe, but you don't know where it is. Um, so that was a critical instrument NASA entrusted to us. Um, the other one was a spectrograph. It doesn't show nice pictures. It's a spectrograph lines, but it detects uh, new planets, exoplanets. So in exchange for that, we pay, Canada pays its, the development of that, um, but we negotiate time uh, or scientific data. So in this case, Canadian astronomers get 5% of the uh, um, telescope time. <clears throat> this is just one one image uh, I chose, it's called the Tarantula Nebula. It shows uh, gas formation, formation of stars. Um, you can go and find a lot of these images on Flickr or on the NASA website. Um, there's so much information coming out now. And in addition to the science and the knowledge that come out, they're just stunningly beautiful. And they look really great on your uh, background on team or zoom, like, you know, this all, all available. Um, it's another quick example here. This interesting little um, spacecraft is called Osiris Rex. It was another NASA mission and it was Canada's first um, time participating in what we call a sample return mission. So this, um, uh, spacecraft went to asteroid named Bennu. Um, Canada supplied the instrument that mapped the uh, asteroid, which then determined where sort of basically the arm would go down and pick up a sample. Um, again, um, so that was launched in uh, uh, 2016. The sample was corrected in 2020. It's on its way back to Earth. Um, it will be dropped, supposed to be dropped in the Utah desert in September of this year. Um, the reason we study asteroids is really because it, it answers uh, how our solar system were actually formed. Um, so again, Canada will receive a portion of the sample uh, that was collected. Now, listen, you know, it's not like huge rocks come back, uh, you know, it's 60, 100, maybe 200 grams, like, you know, it's a small amount. But uh, some of the sample that Canada will receive will be examined and tested now. Some will be uh, stored for a later date until uh, technologies advance and our knowledge of how to look at these materials um, advance. It's a bit difficult not to talk about the International Space Station. So I've talked about robots, talked about far away, but um, turn to humanity here. Um, the International Space Station is the largest lab in the world. It is a laboratory. It's about the size of a US football field. Uh, humans have been living continuously on there for uh, over 20 years now. So it's really a, a, a stepping stone to the next adventure to have, let's say, a settlement or humans on the moon. Um, it is about 400 kilometers above us. It orbits at eight kilometers a second. And so there's actually something like 16 or 17 sunrise and sunsets in a day or in a 24 hours. Um, 
It is a partnership between NASA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, which is the Japanese Space Agency, Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, and the CSA. Um, so Canada supplied, I'll get the hang of this uh, toward the end. So Canada supplied, I talked about the robotics, the one that's on the $5 bill. So look at compared, this is 17 meters long uh, compared to the whole space station. This is the living uh, portion and the lab portion. Um, the robotics, the arm um, was used to construct the space station. It was, uh, it's used for uh, maintenance. It ferries uh, astronauts around when they do space uh, spacewalks, but it also prevents um, or eliminates the need for so many spacewalks. They are expensive, they are dangerous. Astronauts love to do them, of course, it's a big challenge. Um, but when they use robotic operations, uh, they do. Um, it will be retiring around 2020. Uh, it is now an old infrastructure, if you will. It's been out in uh, hazards of space for uh, over, uh, over 20 years. And so that's why it retire, um, but the commercial, the companies uh, are gonna move into this space, if you will. Um, I'm aware of at least four uh, companies or consortium that are uh, working to build their own space station. Um, they're hoping to actually launch before the uh, ISS gets deorbited. Um, and what that does for, let's say a country like Canada, is that we have to, these aren't Canadian companies. <laughs> these are uh, right now uh, US companies. So how do we, how do we work how, um, with them? Right now, CSA, all space agencies work agency to agency, government to government. Um, it's a tried and true model. We know how to do that. But now we're introducing a new partner or someone new taking over. And so, because what, while we contribute the robotics and operate the robotics is still only about 2.5% of what it costs to run the, that, uh, the space station. Um, so, in, but in exchange, we get time in the lab, we get astronaut flights, um, but so how do we maintain that for Canadian organizations in a, um, in a commercial world? It's an area government's not that comfortable with. Um, and so the, and, and no one really fully knows how it works. So NASA is funding some of these uh, companies to look at different models, um, start the planning, uh, they're raising their own capital, but we still don't know exactly how it's going to work because this is what we call low earth orbit so it goes around the space it goes around the earth so it will always be needed um so how do we work together is something that we're working on but they will sell uh lab services that's their idea that they'll be there for tourism for science manufacturing in zero gravity uh, crystal manufacturing. So they see it as a business um, and it is. <laughs> so with uh, commercial uh, entities taking over low earth orbit, we're moving farther into, into space. Uh, so we wanna get to Mars eventually, um, but Mars is far. Um, it take about six to seven months to get there. The moon is a thousand times farther than the um, uh, uh, International Space Station. Um, moon takes about five days to get there. But Canada has joined on to what is called the Artemis program, which is uh, NASA-led endeavor to return to the moon. 
any of you interested in Greek mythology, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. It's been more than 50 years since the Apollo program and, uh, and Americans have uh, stepped foot on the moon. Um, there's a series of missions that have started. Um, they're all sequential, they're all sequentially numbered. Artemis one was a test mission that flew November and December. Uh, no crew on it. So it, it was uh, the largest rocket ever built. Uh, new rocket tested. Um, it was a test, test method. Really, really, everyone's really, really happy with the results. Artemis II will also be a test mission, but this time with crew. It'll supposed to launch in late 2024. So that's not too far away. So this time, it will be a crew of four, three NASA astronauts, one Canadian astronaut, and we will be announcing in Houston on April 3rd who that Canadian astronaut is. We're quite excited. Um, and it'll be 10 day mission. So two days they'll test around the moon and then they'll go four days to the moon. They'll go around the moon furthest they've ever been. It won't land this time in four days to come back and then they splash down in the, in the Pacific. And then Artemis three, a few years later where they'll actually land uh, astronauts on the moon and then eventually um, work to set up a kind of infrastructure pre pre uh, uh, presence, um, that is all being, architecture is all being worked out now. But the reason uh, Canada was able to secure a spot on Artemis II is because we agreed to uh, participate in uh, what is known as the Lunar Gateway. So it's like a much smaller international space station. It will, I have a video here, it will orbit the moon. Um, uh, it, uh, we are building right now design phase, uh, what we call Canada Arm 3. Uh, we're going to supply the robotics, world leader. Um, our robotics are supposed to launch about 2027. So again, it'll be a science lab. It'll be a test bed for new technologies. There'll be a rendezvous part, rendezvous portion to go from the uh, gateway spaces and down to, down to the moon. Um, and then one day it be a stepping stone to Mars. So unlike the International Space Station, uh, they'll only be have crew there, humans there about uh, one month a year. So the robotics become even more important um, without someone there. Some people like to say, you know, to turn the lights off, water the plants, those kind of things, but that's maybe uh, a little bit. So you can see the... Um, a bit of an animation there. So in addition to the Lunar Gateway, right, we do have a lunar exploration program. Um, for the first time in history, we've just announced this a little while ago, uh, a Canadian rover uh, will explore the moon and help with the international search for water ice. So there's known to be water ice, um, there needs to be more exploration of it. And the reason that's very important is because if you have water, you can separate the hydrogen to have fuel to go further um, and you can have oxygen to breathe. So it's quite important. So it will land uh, on the South, South Pole, which is where most of the water ice has been uh, discovered, 2026. So six, six science instruments on this, it's a little rover. Um, five Canadian, and for the first time, the reverse is happening. There'll be a NASA science instrument on our bigger instrument. NASA will, uh, will launch it for us. That was part of the understanding. Um, there's actually some commercial um, activity on the way uh, going to the moon right now, actually, like not government. Um, there, uh, and, and Canada's a part of that. So two Canadian 
companies we help to fund and develop their technology, um, but they're uh, Japanese uh, lander, moon lander, and uh, rover from the UAE. So Canadian technology will actually be used to control the rover from the here, here being the earth, and, um, and uh, cameras, special cameras. It's actually just entered into lunar orbit right now. Just really, really quickly, part of what we're doing now. Uh, so, but how do you, is how do you keep uh, astronauts healthy? Saves challenges. Some of the reasons we're working on that is because the challenges of keeping astronauts healthy, the same challenges that affect those in uh, remote, rural, Arctic communities. Richard, maybe we need to speak about your new, um, your new. Uh, health initiative. <laughs> um, the same applies for food. So how are you going to feed people on the moon or in Mars? Uh, again, same challenges, remote, remote communities. They don't necessarily grow. We have, uh, we have uh, experiments going on right now with, um, in Joe Haven in, the, uh, in Nunavut. Uh, with the Arctic Research Foundation, but also with the National Research Council Agriculture uh, Canada. So again, the community is involved. So while space exploration gets a lot of attention, it's really, wow, it is really, really exciting. Um, a lot of the reason we do this though, is for us on earth. Um, your lives today depend on space. Uh, you may not realize it, uh, but every day, all the time, uh, you are relying on space. Um, from a science perspective, uh, agriculture, uh, banking, um, determinants of health, there's just so much reliance on space right now. And I don't know if anybody can uh, sort of zoom in on this. I don't know if anybody recognizes it. So first of all, what's interesting, one, you see how small our atmosphere is compared. So Prince Edward Island, mainland Nova Scotia, Bay of Fundy, Cape Breton, Bradour Lake. Anyone recognize this one? Town of Aniganish, Aniganish Harbor. This is actually not a Canadian satellite that took this, uh, this image. It was actually a European Space Agency image, but this is October 30th, 2022, the recent one. One of the big priorities that we have as a government and as a space agency is uh, climate change. So understanding how the climate is changing, also looking at things like uh, thinning ice, sea level rise, changing shorelines, measuring emissions, they can all be done more easily from, from space. Just a couple of examples. I guess you all lived through Hurricane Fiona. Uh, Prince Edward Island, oh, image, image, okay. So Prince Edward Island, this was taken August 21st. This image was taken September 25th, just hours after Fiona moved offshore. So you see uh, the churn in the ocean, uh, you see the erosion, um, you, it just shows you quickly um, the extent of, uh, of the effects. Um, we have just announced that we will be, there's a lot of acronyms in the space world, but we were going to be uh, working on a project, new, new uh, project called uh, HAWK, it stands for 
high altitude and water vapor and clouds. So again, it's an international mission. Uh, NASA led, uh, J Japanese are involved, uh, the French Space Agency, and it will really be to increase the understanding of the uh, atmospheric science. So Canada will provide three instruments and one satellite, and it'll detect uh, um, extreme, uh, do extreme weather uh, prediction, climate modeling, disaster modeling. And what's interesting here is that from the get-go, 13 Canadian universities uh, are involved um, right away, including Sanofax. Another new mission that we're working on again with increasing um, uh, wildfires is what we call WildfireSat. Uh, will be launched uh, 2029. I will provide more uh, precise um, monitoring of wildfires so we can make more informed decisions. Pilot project to identify endangered North Atlantic right, right whales. Um, space can see a lot. Um, we're trying to see how well we can see them from space. Um, we are uh, trying to detect, predict where they're going. Um, when that's overlaid with shipping data, which actually company in, uh, in Halifax, um, the world leader in the shipping location, um, you're able to better uh, protect the whales. Okay, so some examples of what's going on now, um, but the rapid growth means, you know, a lot of other challenges. Um, the, this is a rendition of the earth. The photo of the earth is a real one. Um, the image, the, the, the debris and the satellites is, is done by our graphic people, but it's not unrealistic. There is a lot of uh, satellites up there now, debris. You don't, wanna, you don't wanna have any collisions in space. It's a real disaster. So one little collision, creates many, 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 many uh, pieces of debris. Um, so, you know, how do we fix that? How do we fix the congestion? Um, there are, uh, so the, the US Department of Defense actually keep a catalog of thousands and thousands of space objects, uh, big, small, um, they kindly supply that, that information to us. We manipulate the data and provide a service to Canadian uh, satellite operators. Uh, so if there is a piece of debris or something else coming in the way that they move, they can move them. Obviously their satellites are controlled from, from the ground. Um, just last week, actually, the International Space Station had to change orbits twice in one week. So they basically have to fire the fire thrusters to move it to a different orbit. Um, there's work on regulations, norms of behavior, um, different technologies uh, that will help deorbit uh, space debris or defunct satellites faster. Um, They'll take a little while, uh, however. Um, but the re reality is like the regulations aren't keeping pace with the, the, the growth, either in low earth orbit or in, in deep space. So um, the treaty that governs the civil world in space dates back to 1967. So it's a much different world. It's called the Outer Space Treaty. Um, Again, there wasn't this many, there wasn't this much going on in space at the time. Not a lot of interest uh, in developing new treaties at the moment. Those negotiate, these are done in the context of the United Nations. It tough, been tough for a little while to get, uh, you know, advancement. Um, Canada championed what's called the long-term sustainability guideline. That took 10 years to do before it finally went to the UN General Assembly. Um, and then if you talk about deep space, moon, Mars, 
um, that's kind of the wild west. Like no one really knows how that's going to work. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, Canada signed, Canada was involved quite in the negotiations, something called the Artemis Accords, which was basically just agreeing that you conduct yourself in a certain way. So preserve historic sites, uh, let others know uh, what you're doing on celestial bodies, uh, share the scientific data. So 20, at the moment, 23 countries have uh, joined. But again, you know, it's gonna have to be more and agree on how to operate in space. Um, I said our, our regulatory system is uh, lacking. Uh, we've actually just, we've launched a consultation. So we are working on updating our regulatory uh, framework. So for launch, Transport Canada is regulate launch because you're in this area where there will be launch. Uh, they will be uh, updating regulations uh, for launch. Uh, we're looking at how to regulate payloads. Um, some of the things that are, you may not intuitively think about, how do you regulate things like on-orbit servicing? Um, what, do you do with, what do you do with robotics? Um, the robotics are great. There's some technologies that are being looked at now that, you know, like one satellite will go up and let's say grab another satellite and push it down into an orbit where it burns up in the atmosphere. But there's some other implications for that, uh, that as well. Uh, liability, uh, who can use resources on the moon? We all agreed that they're, they don't belong to one particular uh, country. Um, What's re-entry like? So that work is going on now. Um, another area is, uh, you know, everything is digital. The thing with satellites is everything is digital. It's data. One thing, the data is, is a lot, but everything is more vulnerable now as well. Uh, cyber threats are very real in space as well. Um, and the other big thing is uh, labor. Just like everywhere else, there are labor shortages um, in, uh, in the country. Labor force is, uh, workforce is solid though and growing across uh, the country. We have uh, about 12,000 direct jobs attributed to space, uh, 24,000 indirect jobs um, at the agency and at, in the government of Canada in general. We try to promote uh, people entering uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, we try and promote, as well as you can see, uh, girls and, and uh, young women in STEM, uh, sorry, in the space sector, only 29% of uh, people identify as female. So we try and promote that. But we talk about STEM, but really, these are just some examples. It's not just people in STEM that are needed in, this, in the field, like um, uh, financial analysts, technical writers, uh, accountants, like it's a growing field. You want, an, you want, a, you want a, a career in space, you could probably, you could probably have it. Um, so, so consider it. Um, and the other, uh, we do try and uh, communicate. We're quite active on social media. If uh, you want to follow us, you know, regular platforms, all there. Our website is a wealth of information, we think. Um, we try and do it in a serious way, but we also try and do it in a fun way. So for those of you for the top, uh, you know, talking about Canadian robotics. Did you know play a special role? Canada Arm 2 as well. Uh, we're going to have Canada Arm 3. Uh, every week we try and put out a kind of funny thing. If you can't write, putting on a spacesuit takes about 45 minutes, pretty much the same time it takes to put on a, a space snowsuit on a toddler. And then in both cases, you never want to hear, but I really need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Maybe that uh, resonates more with people who have kids with parents, but uh, yeah, so you're, uh, 
uh, welcome and encouraged to follow us. It's an exciting time. Last week, we unveiled a new logo, Modern Times. Here we go. There you go. So, Canada's taking more flight. <laughs> There you are. So thanks so much for listening to me. Um, I do appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, Mike. Well, thank you so much for that, that presentation. Um, we have a lot of time for, for questions, and I, I know that I have a few, but I'm sure there's some out there. Uh, in the uh, the audience tonight, it is incredible how many facets of this country, right, is shaped by the space program and the investments that are made into the, uh, you know, space R and D as you're highlighting. I remember uh, one of the first times I went to the Northwest Passage, we picked up this American NASA engineer, uh, and we were going to Devon Island, and we just yeah. dropped him off. I was like, well, I hope he's okay, but you know, I guess, you know, <laughs> they're great. doing research there, right? Because of yeah. course it mimics, you know, what, yeah, what it's yeah. going to be like on Mars. And, and the great greenhouses in Joe Haven been in those. So again, another example of where investment in our space program is having a big impact on innovation and, and development here. So a lot of exciting stuff. You raised a lot of exciting things in that talk. I'm gonna throw it out to the audience just to get going here. Any questions, please. Um, I just wanna say that was awesome. Uh, very eye-opening to the prospects of uh, space and space exploration. I was um, wondering your thoughts were on the private sector's expansion into space and uh, especially space exploration, you know, uh, SpaceX, and companies like that, and whether or not you think that's some good competition or if uh, you know, the profit motive is ultimately that, like, you know, this common good of space space is all about. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think, I think private industries, um, entrance into the space world, I think it's inevitable. Uh, it does lead to uh, cost decreases. Um, it doesn't mean a lot of these companies, including SpaceX though, yes, they put in their billions of dollars, but so have public, public agencies. Um, SpaceX uh, is probably, uh, you know, the most keen to get to Mars. Um, they're developing something called the Starship, I think, uh, that like it's a huge, huge uh, rocket vehicle. Um, it, it will be a game changer. Um, again, it's how do the how do the regulations and the safety aspects um, keep up? Um, you know, uh, the space station partnership. Uh, they decided that they'd allocate about 5% of their time or, uh, or budget for like commercial activities. So there is a company called um, Axiom uh, that actually brought uh, four private, they call them private astronauts now to the space station. It was supposed to be for about seven days. It turned into about two weeks because of weather they couldn't, they couldn't get back down. Uh, but those four individuals, they paid, they paid to go to that big, big dollars to, to Axiom. There was one Canadian aboard as well. So it, 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 it it's going to be a new world for sure. Please, Cameron. Um, so you briefly mentioned the like, the effects of having like, what does kind of like happen to you? Mm. Yeah, uh, the, what, the effects that I know about. So Canada has, we have like science time on the International Space Station. We've concentrated uh, our efforts or our R&D in that, in that area to try and understand uh, better. But things like um, your, the body in zero gravity, the body gets longer, um, uh, bones get brittler, uh, muscles deteriorate. They say there's more hardening of the arteries. There's problems with the eyes as well. Um, there's radiation, of course. 
in the space station, it goes around the Earth, so it's still shielded a little bit, but you go further, there's more radiation uh, possibilities. What's interesting, though, is when the astronauts return to Earth, a lot of those effects are reversed, reversed over time. So they say, like, if they can find the trigger for how do you get your bones to re-solidify, that maybe that would be uh, very beneficial for people suffering with osteoporosis. So, um, yeah. So I missed the last part, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, are there any thoughts in terms of policy with the increase in satellites and such, um, but their effects on either ground-based observational astronomy or oh. That it, that if something called the dark sky for the astronomers that is uh, very much in peril right now. Uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of work going on there. Um, sometimes actually, uh, if you look up, you, you can sometimes see the Starlink satellites if they've just been launched, they're all in a row um, before they get, they get spread out, so yes. There's actually work on uh, dark sky in the UN world, they call it dark sky and quiet sky because of all the radio frequency issues as well. But yeah, it's a challenge. You briefly mentioned the UN there. How do you see um, intergovernmental organizations such as the UN playing a role in the future of space and space exploration, specifically the control of uh, and the desire to use the so I think the UN is key. The challenge is that it doesn't, it's not fast. It's not fast. I don't want to say it's not fast enough, but you know, what's great is that all countries are there and they're all talking about what to do. Um, but mm -hmm. um, other mechanisms will be necessary. Uh, be, I think before the UN um, is able to uh, to have you know agreements on various areas. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good, a very good question. Um, yes. So the system is interdependent. The International Space Station is international. If that's what specifically you're asking about. Um, so, albeit the atrocities that are going on right now in Ukraine, uh, Canada um, is very concerned with the safe operation of the space station, uh, safety of the astronauts as well. And uh, so, that partnership is maintained. Yeah. Thank you. What prompted the new one? Um, the old one, I guess, served us well, I think, since 1992. It's very busy, uh, uh, didn't mean a lot to a lot of people. The move now is more simplified, uh, sleeker. Um, while there was a maple leaf, in it before they, you know, it was pretty small. Um, there was just our initials, CSA, Agence Spatiale Canadienne, ASC. So it didn't mean a lot. Uh, so we, uh, we thought we're on a we're on a we're on a growing trajectory as well, and it was time to to refresh. And it, quite frankly, we wanted it to be um, have it in time for. Uh, um, our astronaut that's going to go to the moon, around the moon, not on the moon, around the moon. Uh, with the like closing of Gateway and our contribution to it, like in a result of that, we've got one astronaut around the moon, but past that, like how is that, like how are our astronauts going to be put into space? 
Okay, so um, thanks. So we actually have two astronaut flights with a contribution to Lunar Gateway. The first one, um, Artemis II, we did negotiate another flight later on. So um, it takes a while to negotiate agreements, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> if you want to talk about governance, uh, geopol geopolitical, yes, school of government here. Um, so with our partnership on the space station and, and with NASA and the European Space Agency, we have, uh, you know, we have dialogue all the time, technical dialogue. And so when an organization as big as NASA starts talking about, okay, we're gonna go to the moon, I think we'll, we'll develop, we're gonna have a, you know, a lunar gateway, something that goes around the moon. And, and then they start talking about the architecture, well, our scientists and engineers are in with those discussions and, and they say, well, you're gonna need, you know, Canadian expertise, Canadian technologies, we wanna be there. That takes a little while. And then then something that large, like the this, this, this Canadian Space Agency can't fund that out of its everyday everyday budget. It's, it's a large amount. And so then we have to uh, convince government that, this is a great thing for, for Canada and we need uh, more money. Once we have that, then, uh, then we uh, need to negotiate, well, how is it gonna work? So we say, we're gonna provide Canada Arm 3. We're gonna do the operations in Canada. Uh, and so what do we get in exchange? And so it's actually a treaty their treaty level. So we have to go to cabinet, get the authority to negotiate a treaty, then you negotiate. Um, and then you go to parliament because you have to table the treaty. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it probably took that whole mechanism of uh, just, just once we got the funding was, was easily a couple of years, a couple of years of work. But we also get um, not just the two flights, uh, science time for the first time ever uh, operations will be uh, of, of solely outside of the US. Right now, uh, Canada Arm 2 is operated from Houston, from the space station, and as well from uh, CSA facilities in, uh, in Montreal. But that, it took a while to get the Operation Center in Montreal. Lisa, you mentioned that you took on your current role in 2016. Yeah. I'm just curious about the path you took to this position and just wondering maybe when you realized you were interested in space. That's a good question. To be very frank with you, um, it, it was an opportunity that fell in my lap. I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I really want to work in the space field someday. Um, I have been in, uh, in uh, federal government, you know, many years. Um, and uh, uh, this, I heard that the space agency was looking for someone in Ottawa to um, help them with their, uh, um, let me just say, liaison and work with the rest of other government departments, uh, know how government works. Um, it's great working in a smaller agency if you're in a government. So for whatever level you're at, your level of responsibility is generally much higher than in a, a big, big, big department. Um, but, you know, we're a very technical organization um, not everyone's interested in how government works, <laughs> also outside in a region. So I, I know that they were looking for someone and it was just, uh, it was just, uh, I actually called them up. I'd never called, I did a cold call before. I hear you're looking for someone, but uh, that's, that's pretty much how it happened. But, you know, it's been, it's been fabulous. I mean, it, every day is different. You're pushing the boundaries, it's innovation. And as a government organization, um, it involves everything, you know, intergovernmental relations, uh, international relations, 
um, working with other uh, departments like science and technology, like there's there's so much, and and you know you get to you get to do uh, you do some really cool things, and you get to say things like we have a Canadian astronaut going around the moon soon, so yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm gonna use my prerogative here as the uh, leading the question session here. Um, so it strikes me for your comments, right? How much of this is predicated on international relations and on kind of quiet negotiations? Um, so one thing that does come up in the emergency management field a lot is the kind of international charter on uh, space and major disasters. Mm -hmm. um, again, pretty significant information sharing agreement between a number of countries. Just wondering if you could comment a little bit about Canada's role sure. in this charter and uh, in both its creation and its execution. Yeah, for sure. I can't tell you how long ago it was created. We just had an anniversary. I can't remember if it was 10 or more years. So, so um, organizations in space generally work, work together. And uh, so Canada, European Space Agency and another one, I can't remember right now, together and says, you know what, we can share data. We all have satellites in space when there's a disaster. Uh, hurricane, uh, um, fires, um, earthquakes. Um, so, you know, the, the horrible earthquake in uh, Syria, Turkey, you know, we activate the charter and then all share, share data to help with, with recovery. So um, it, it's, it's a, let's say a humanitarian, uh, humanitarian effort. Canadian companies as well, and I'm sure other private companies participate as well, uh, provide provide images. So it's uh, it's something, you know, it takes work. There's a mechanism. Uh, every country chairs, takes over chairing. Um, so it's uh, it's it's a good thing. Uh, it does uh, it does a lot of good. Um, but uh, again, mechanisms are needed. Uh, for any kind of agreement like that. <laughs> so, uh, Barry, you mentioned that um, that uh, there's a local company that's building yep. um, Canada's first space launch center very close by. Uh, another good reason to come to St. Evex pretty soon. You could potentially go and watch rockets being launched uh, from uh, a location about 45 minutes from here, I think about 45 minute drive to get out to where they'll actually be launching. Pretty cool thing to perhaps be able to see, bring some tourism. Can you speak, like, is what's the space agency role in, you know, in the relationship with that initiative or, you know, um, what perhaps could um, become of that, mm -hmm. you know, given that that's happening in Canada for the first time right here in Rural Nova Scotia. <laughs> okay. You gonna set up an office in uh, here uh, in Nanaganish that uh, you know, put some people down. There? You know what? We just we just might. <laughs> um, it's, it's spaceport is the word. The space launch facility, spaceport. So um, it uh, is a commercial endeavor. So, as to my knowledge, the Canadian government is not a, a direct player. Uh, CSA is not, um, but uh, we we promote to international uh, entities. Um, uh, we are working with Transport Canada on the regulations because there will be requirements for, of course, different kinds of regulation. Um, so that's that's the extent of our involvement now. Um, who knows, we may uh, launch, we may have, uh, I don't know, small satellite competition for students uh, and maybe contract with them to, to launch them. So. Is it possible that Canada would launch its own rockets from a, from a commercial space? There are some Canadian uh, companies working on launch rockets. They're developing their, uh, there's a company in Montreal um, that has an affiliation uh, with Maritime Launch Service. 
um, still in development. Um, it will, my understanding is it will be, um, it, it could take different kinds of rockets, including from international uh, or other, other countries. Um, it's interesting, uh, Canadian students at universities, they just um, clean up at rocket competitions. <laughs> um, and, and this particular company in Montreal is actually a spin-off from a graduate student and developed the technology there. And so um, we'll see how that goes. We wish you luck. Um, so you mentioned that we don't we don't know like specific parts of different uh, spacecraft and machines. Um, so I just was wondering, do we okay, does the Canadian Space Agency get told that this is what they need, or is it something that we sort of think of, oh, we need to engineer this, or you know, like how does that process go about it? Are we instructed to do something? Are we just kind of thinking this is something that needs to be built, how does that work? Yeah, so, so again, there's a lot of discussions internationally on, from the technical folks on what's coming up, what's going. Um, uh, the, the CSA is not told, you, you must do this. Um, being a government agency though, we, you know, we have to always, you know, we have to plan, we identify priorities, we have to identify what, where money is gonna go, what, uh, projects, uh, we have to report on it. Um, but if you ask, um, you know, like the the researchers, the engineers, like there's there's just not enough, there's just not enough funding to do, you know, everything that, you know, people, people dream about uh, doing either, um, you know, a scientific instrument on another, um, uh, let's say country satellite, or maybe in the future a company satellite. Um, but we do also manufacture our own own satellites. Yeah, um, the the uh, we're we're an ex Canada is an expert in uh, what is called um, SAR synthetic aperture radar. So it's a radar technology. The the pictures of the Earth and any Ganesha PI that I showed you, those are those are photos. Those are optical uh, from different satellites. Uh, Canada's leading technology uh, is radar based, so you, it it's different uh, images, but you can it can see through cloud. It can see night, um, so it's in a way more versatile. But it takes more manipulation, um, and so we. Uh, funded and built, oh, well, we contracted out to, to MDA to build um, our biggest um, uh, uh, constellation of satellites, which is three uh, uh, that orbit the Earth. It, um, they uh, provide ser um, services to other government departments. So the, the, the imagery uh, is key to about 60 government services, including for like Coast Guard, Defense, that is a key operational need for the government of Canada. Um, yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, my sort of a two part question. Uh, one is how far do you think we are from uh, asteroid mining? And two, as, do you see a shift or a concern in shifts from government to enterprise? Yeah, so uh, so good question. That is one area where we are working in the United Nations framework, space resource utilization. How do, how will that work? Um, the the belief is that there are a lot of minerals on asteroids, and you know. I guess after we're finished mining the earth, we'll go mine the asteroids. Um, but yeah, there aren't a lot of rules uh, for governments or for uh, uh, companies as well. Um, 
personally, I think it's it's several years, several it's several decades away. I mean, you know, it's it's expensive. Um, you know, the the little funny instrument I I showed you, Osiris Rex. I you know that collected a sample, but you know it's still small. So to make it worthwhile, um, you're going to have to have really really deep pockets. But again, it's an area where you know, norms, regulations need to keep up. I'll just work our way this way, so please. Um, so for uh, years and years to come, some of the focus is going to be on controls. But let's say um, eventually we can get to Mars. Selling there, maybe terraforming kind of whatever. Um, what is the new frontier? After Mars, that's a really good question. I guess uh, how far can humanity go? I guess uh, is a, you know a question. Um, there are robotic um, missions that go to a bunch of other planets. They're not that hospitable. <laughs> um, you know, it'll be it'll be decades and decades before I think you 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 get a settlement uh, settlement on Mars. Like it's it's not that hospitable, but um, yeah, it'll be. I mean, you know, you can dream. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, are we going to have like Star Wars or Star Trek, you know, like on a five year mission? Maybe someday. I don't know. Please. Um, that's like making a poor in Canada. How will that like affect our relations with like the US if we're not getting the port? The spaceport? Um, well, there is a, an issue of, of, of sovereignty and to be able to, you know, launch from your own country. It, I mean, it will simplify matters. Um, it's, there are a lot of rules to transport and cross the country, but I don't think that uh, it'll affect our relation at all. I mean, what, what would be nice is actually if some of these other countries came to us, because the, the need for launch is, is very significant. So, yeah. Thank you, I was wondering earlier you mentioned the fact that a lot of people know about the Communities for Peace um, program for girls in science, and the fact that you also work in schools. Is there a strategy to encourage more children to go into science and being strengthened? Um, yes, we, we work hard, not just to promote STEM for STEM, the sake of STEM, but we try and link it and it's more effective, um, when we have, uh, when we link it to a mission or something we're actually doing, um, we send our astronauts out, our scientists, um, as well speak to communities, schools, um, of course, got uh, curtailed for a while with COVID, but we're doing, uh, we're, we're starting those up uh, again. Um, we, had, we had this great program uh, called the Junior Astronaut Program, where it was like a, uh, almost like a, the same process that actual astronaut candidates would go through. And then the idea is they would you know, they do a certain number of activities. You could sign up. This was for, I think, grades like four to seven. Um, but you need the schools to be involved. And so we also work with schools or like, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and the idea was that these kids would come to the, our space agency for, for a week and do a lot of the things that the astronauts do. So um, we train every single astronaut that goes to the space station on how to work the robotics. And so, uh, so they come and they spend a week like 
real live astronauts, cosmonaut um, from all over the world, but we were going to have the kids, you know, doing that. And then of course we ended up having to do all that virtually. So um, it's, uh, we're doing more. Uh, we're doing more for younger for younger kids. So hopefully, you'll see uh, you'll see more. But, yeah. I have a, another question. Actually, uh, we spent a lot of time talking tonight about opportunities. And it's very clear there's so many opportunities here. The potential is incredible, and the impact on our, our broader society is incredible. There's also hazards, um, right? And I think you know when I think about solar flares, right? That can mm -hmm. potentially affect our communications and energy systems, asteroids, these kinds of things. Wondering what is the Canadian Space Agency doing on that front? Often, obviously, with our allies. What are, what are some of the things around that that we are doing? That uh, specifically, space weather hazards or uh, hazards? Okay, it's easier. Easy. Earth objects, solar flares. These Is so, solar flares are easier to talk about than okay. earth objects. <laughs> So yeah, the sun is very active now. Uh, auroras all over the place, actually. Um, they do interfere with uh, things like uh, oil drilling, hydro, uh, electricity, um, telecommunications. Uh, we do the science. Um, we do the, let's, uh, yeah, the better understanding of the science, but it's actually Natural Resources Canada that does the monitoring and the alerts out to, to industry. There's a, it's called the Canadian Hazard Information Service. And they, uh, again, uh, outside of Montreal. Um, yeah, we do, we do work uh, on, uh, for Canadian satellite operators on, um, Collision avoidance, uh, we provide that information uh, for free. Yeah, so, but it, because it's, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very much needed, it's growing. Um, there are some uh, companies that are wanting to get into that, uh, that business as well. I know this is the first time I've had the opportunity to talk to someone from Canada's Space Agency. Um, just wondering, any other questions? Uh, you know, seize this opportunity. Anything you want to know about Final Frontier? <laughs> Anything like that? Please. I'm uh, just curious, so do you think it's something we should uh, take note of that uh, a lot of people or kids growing up want to, their dream if they're looking at space is to work for NASA, even if they're in Canada. And a lot of people don't understand. They aren't uh, knowledgeable that TSA exists. Yeah. yeah. I'm honestly, this is the first time I've heard of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if that's a sort of point at which is worth uh, helping you with. Yeah. I mean, I I I understand. Uh, you know, NASA. NASA is big. NASA is. It, they're really great communicators also. They have a lot of resources. Um, you know, they, they will do things that we, we couldn't do as a smaller organization, it's true. But um, we hate to lose uh, qualified people, skilled people to any other country, but we're actually seeing some of them come back now. Um, which is which is nice. So you know, maybe ten years ago they didn't see an opportunity, and so they went to um, NASA or um, big American uh, companies. But we are seeing some of the specialists come back, which is nice. There is one other thing I wanted to say, actually, Please. if you have an Oculus or you know the virtual reality. Um, so there is a company in Montreal. Um, they have done filming on the International Space Station. And so it's called the ISS Experience. Um, so you can it, it, plug, the company is called Felix and Paul, the multimedia company, but you, you wear the virtual reality goggles 
and you can be in the space station with the astronauts. Um, and then all of a sudden you like, you're looking around, you look down, oh my God, there's the earth. It's, it's stunning. And uh, they have uh, as well, um, one they call space walkers. So again, Canadian technology, first time ca cameras like that went outside the space station. Um, anyway, you feel like you're space, you're a space walker with them. So if, uh, if you want to have, uh, you know, if you have people interested uh, in going into that world, it's like, you get, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oscar, did you come armed with a question? You just, you a class, I know. But... I, I, got, I, I wish I did. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I would ask maybe, and again, this is, uh, you know, I just came in, so this could have been talked about moments ago, um, but I, I wonder when, when, when we look at the, kind of the United States and how they've taken an approach to um, uh, space defense and these sort of things, how do you see, um, how do you see that approach versus Kind of more of a scientific approach, and, and which one do you think we should be prioritizing um, kind of moving forward in, in space policy? So, did you say space defense? Well, yeah, space. The space for defense purposes? Yeah, space for defense purposes, where they, I think they call it the space force. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then we have other countries kind of focused more on, um, you know, scientific research and those sort of things. But I'm wondering how those kind of work together and which one is superior. <laughs> <laughs> All for different uh, for different purposes. I've concentrated today on space for civil purposes, for peaceful purposes, um, because that's what the Canadian Space Agency does. It's what NASA does. Um, the U.S. has created, you know, there's Air Force, Army, the U.S. Space Force. That's right. Canada has uh, also created not its own new fourth, but uh, third Canadian space division, so Canadian Department of uh, uh, Defense, Canadian Armed Forces, um, actually it's the Air Force, uh, they are doing more and more in space as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Oscar, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> All right, well, seeing no other hands flying up here, uh, again, a fantastic talk. Really enlightening, learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, uh, I really pleasure. appreciate it. On behalf of the Brian Morini Institute of Government, I'd like to uh, offer you this oh. hefty, uh, <laughs> uh, very much thank you. Thank oh, you so much. That wasn't necessary, but thank you. It's, it's just wonderful. my pleasure to come. Thanks a lot. Honestly, it's one of the best questions we've heard any speaker get. So clearly a very engaged <laughs> audience, very which is awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate okay. it. Uh, very much. I know in a term, really busy. So really, really appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. And there's lunch tomorrow. Pretty good. More questions. We don't have a lot of swag, but we